Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's session. So today we're going to study the second book of the major prophets, uh, that is the book of Jeremiah. Even before we could begin, I would request one of us to lead us in prayer. Can I request Jeffina to lead us in prayer, please? Yes. Yeah. Jay Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this beautiful day and for the amazing class that we're about to have. Lord, I pray for everyone who is right here. God, we ask your presence to fill us, your Holy Spirit to guide us and fill us with understanding, fill us with your knowledge. And for everyone who is right here, help them to open their heart and listen to the words so that they can understand this and apply it in their life and enjoy this life every second with you. I pray for the one who is teaching for us. I pray that you fill her with wisdom, knowledge, and love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Jeffina. Thank you so much. Okay, let me... Um, even before we could uh, start with Jeremiah, uh, yesterday, because Isaiah was a long book and I didn't have an opportunity to play a video on the book of prophets and how we can uh, uh, read the book of prophets, keeping the prophets in mind and what type of life they lived in. So what is this prophet all about? Are they soothsayers or, or are they talking on behalf of God? So um I thought even before we could start today's class, we can uh, I can share this video before we can begin with our class. Let me present that video for you. Give me a minute while I present it. One of y'all, please let me know if you're if the video is audible. Ezekiel, Obadiah, Habakkuk. Was it audible? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ezekiel, Obadiah, Habakkuk. What do these names have in common? Well, they're three of the 15 prophets that have their own books in the Bible. And if you've tried to read these books, odds are you got lost in their dense poetry and strange imagery. But these books are super important for understanding the overall biblical story. So let's talk about how to read the prophets. When I hear the word prophet, I think of a fortune teller, someone who predicts the future. That's what being a prophet means in many cultures, but not in the Bible. While the biblical prophets sometimes speak about the future, they're way more than fortune tellers. How should I think about them? Well, they were Israelites who had a radical encounter with God with the presence and then were commissioned to go and speak on God's behalf. Like a representative. Right. And the thing that they cared about the most is the mutual partnership that existed between God and the Israelites. ...in Egypt and invited them to become a nation of justice and generosity that would represent his character to the nations. And so this partnership required all Israelites to give their trust and allegiance to their God alone. In the Bible, this partnership is called the covenant. But the leaders, the priests, the kings led Israel astray and they broke the covenant. So this is where the prophets came in, to remind Israel of their role in the partnership. And they did this in three ways. First, they were constantly accusing Israel for violating the terms of the covenant. The charges usually include idolatry, alliances with other nations and their gods, and allowing injustice towards them. Ah, so like covenant lawyers. Right. And so second, the prophets called the Israelites to repent, which means simply to turn around. They spoke of God's mercy to forgive them if they would just confess and change their way. But Israel and its leaders didn't change. Things went from bad to worse. And so that brings us to the third way the prophets emphasized the covenant. They announced the consequences for breaking it, which they called the day of the Lord. Oh yeah, the apocalypse. Visions of the end of the world. Well, sort of. The prophets were mostly interested in how God would bring his justice on Israel's corruption and on the violent nations around them. And while explaining these local events, they often used cosmic imagery. Cosmic imagery? Yeah, like Jeremiah. 
He described the exile of the Israelites to Babylon as the undoing of creation itself. The land dissolves into chaos and disorder, no light, no animals or people. Or Isaiah described the downfall of Babylon as the disintegration of the cosmos, stars falling from the sky, the sun going dark. For the prophets, when God acts in human history to bring justice, it's a day of the Lord. So the prophets aren't talking about the end of the world. Well, hold on. They're doing many things at once. The cosmic imagery shows how these important events of their day fit into the bigger story of God's mission to bring down every corrupt and violent nation once and for all. The prophets cared about the present and the future, and the cosmic imagery allowed them to talk about both at the same time. Got it. So no matter when you live, the day of the Lord's bad news if you're part of Babylon. But it's good news if you're waiting for God's kingdom. The day of the Lord pointed to the return of the exiles to Jerusalem. And once again, the prophets use cosmic poetry to describe it. They see a new Jerusalem, like a new Garden of Eden, with all humanity living at peace with each other and with them. And there's a new messianic king who restores God's kingdom in a renewed creation. Beautiful. So those are the three themes in the prophets. These prophets must have been very powerful, persuasive speakers. Well, some were, but others lived on the margins. They would often perform strange symbolic stunts in public to communicate their message. Like when Ezekiel lay in the dirt and built a model of Jerusalem being attacked by Babylon. Or when Isaiah walked around naked for three years as a symbol of the humiliation of exile. So did people pay attention to them? Not really. The stories in these books show how the prophets were a minority group mostly shunned by Israel's leaders. And their writings were a kind of resistance literature. Most people ignored them, that is, until their warnings came true in the Babylonian exile. And after that, people began to take their words seriously. Yes. The works of these earlier prophets were inherited by later unnamed prophets who studied these texts intensely. They're the ones who arranged the Hebrew scriptures as we know them, including the books of the prophets. Okay. And there's 15 books of the prophets. The big three are Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And then there's a collection of 12 smaller prophetic works unified on a single scroll. And in each of these books, you'll read stories about the prophets and their poems and visions, all arranged to show the cosmic meaning of Israel's history. How God would turn their tragic story of failure and exile into a story of hope and restoration for all nations. It's that twin message of prophetic warning and of hope that the prophets cared about so much. And it's a message that we still need to hear. Yeah, that was a short introduction for the Book of Prophets. Well, uh, now we can begin with our class on Jeremiah. I'll just present our PowerPoint slide. Okay, so the book of the prophet of Jeremiah. The author of this book is Jeremiah himself and the date with, uh, which this book was written uh, approximately maybe 627 to 585 BC. And this book contains 52 chapters. Uh, before we could move ahead, I see that some of you all have just logged in. I'll just admit them. Okay, so the introduction of this book is Jeremiah began his prophetic ministry nearly 60 years after the death of Isaiah. 
The book of Jeremiah is an autobiography of Jeremiah, Jeremiah's life and ministry during the reign of the last five kings of Judah. And this book contains multiple prophecies given at different times. It takes some effort to reconstruct the order of the main events of Jeremiah's life as the prophecies are not arranged in the chronological order. Well, Jeremiah spoke to a nation about to be destroyed by the Babylonians for 40 years. And Jeremiah is also called as the weeping prophet because of his deep sorrow over the unrepentant nation and the judgment that has been approached to this nation. And Jeremiah lived to see his prophecies come true uh, and along acknowledged as one of the great prophet of the Old Testament. And Jeremiah serves as an example of someone who remained faithful to God despite of his uh, countless hardship that he had to face in his life. And with that, we see the very purpose of this book, uh, saying that, you know, uh, like God, to proclaim that God created and controls everything. And there is a sin nature to show that the seriousness of Judah's sin demanded divine judgment. And uh, we also see God's remedy for sin. And we see, uh, you know, the divine gift of new heart. And we also see God person to provide the remedy to predict the renewal of Davidic kingship by the coming Messiah and uh, God's we also see God's plan for redemption over the humanity that Messiah will one day establish the millennial kingdom free from the curse of sin and death and we see Jeremiah also as an Isaiah prophesies a uh, written from exile and have two great future events in mind, the return of the Jews from Babylon and redeemed humanity returned to God in the millennium. So with this, we also see some of the unique features that Jeremiah was one most persecuted Old Testament prophet. He was the only prophet forbidden to pray for his nation and he was the only prophet to record as an eyewitness account to Jerusalem's fall and Jeremiah contains Bible's most extended and detailed prophecies about Babylon which is mentioned 164 times and Jeremiah referred to another prophet Micah by name so Jeremiah himself was referred to by Daniel though many of the prophets were contemporaries uh, only one other writing prophet was Daniel was mentioned by name in print by the fellow prophet and Jeremiah also records the last of the three most uh, important unconditional covenant that is the Abrahamic covenant Davidic covenant and the new covenant has been mentioned and recorded in this book with this we will move on to the chapter wise study so in chapter one we see the call of Jeremiah Jeremiah was an Israelite, Israelite priest, but we don't see much of his priestly ritual being performed, but we see him most as a prophet, as a prophet. And he lived and worked in Jerusalem during the final decade of the kingdom of southern Judah. And he was a son of Helkiah, of the priest of Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. And here we see Jeremiah prophesied from the days of Hosea to the captivity. And the Lord tells him that he was sanctified in the belly of his mother to serve God. And Jeremiah was anxious. He is uh, as a child and he could not speak well. The Lord touches his mouth, so he will be a prophet unto the nation. And the Lord plants are compared to the branch of an almond tree, which comes to fruit quickly. And Jeremiah sees a boiling pot facing the north. And evil shall break forth from the north against the inhabitants of Judah. And we see Jeremiah will be protected uh, as he prophesies towards the Israelites. And uh, we see the pious nature in him that it carried him where he first entered the promised land. Israel uh, had forsaken the Lord 
and gone after other gods uh, its own backsliding will be its punishment from the right seed we see that israel has become a degenerate vine and here it says uh, you know israel is saying to the wood you are my father and to the stone you gave birth to me and this sinful nature you know israel thinks that he is very innocent but this has been very hurting to god because israel was going away turning its back to god and going away from god so we see jeremiah was called as a prophet to warn israel against their uh, you know the backsliding nature worshiping the idols and uh, he is also warning them of the severe consequence which will break uh, you know uh, which will lead them to break uh, which is leading uh, severe consequence of breaking the covenant and uh, where god through their idolatry and injustice he even predicted that the empire of this babylon would come as god's servant to bring this judgment on israel by destroying jerusalem and taking away the people into exile so this happened because of their own backslide because of their own sin and this is just because of the consequence of their own sin and sadly his words um, jeremiah words came to reality and he had to see that and that's when we see jeremiah moan bitterly and he's been called as a weeping prophet and now in this book uh, um, you know it comes into existence to the real uh, interesting way in chapter 36 uh, we see that 20 years of jeremiah's preaching in jerusalem god called him to collect all his sermons and poems and essays and commit them into writing so where jeremiah employed a scribe named baruch who wrote down and compiled all of this material into a scroll so that it's been preserved so now we see baruch a scribe also gathered lot of stories about jeremiah and he linked all the pieces together so this is why the book reads like an you know anthology a collection of collections so it's all been arranged to present this prophet as a messenger of god's justice and grace so here we see that the book begins with god calling jeremiah as a prophet and he gives uh, him a dwell vocation that he will be a prophet to israel but also to the nations his words will both uproot and tear down but also plant and build up in other words he is going to accuse israel and warn them of god's coming judgment but at the same time he also has a message of hope for the future so um we see uh, from chapter 1 to 24 there is some message here where it says the collection of jeremiah's writing before the exile and the very core idea is that israel has broken the covenant with god and violated all the terms of the agreements they made that are uh, written in the torah and in a number of ways they adopted the worship of all kinds of canaanite gods building idol shrines for them and over the land and jeremiah develops a metaphor of idol uh, I, I, the idolatry as adultery and uses the language of prostitution unfaithfulness to describe how israel has given their allegation to other gods well jeremiah also repeatedly accuses israel leaders the priests the kings and the other prophets have all become corrupt and they have got and they have abandoned the torah and the covenant which uh, they have made with god which led them to a tragic result in uh, social injustice the most vulnerable people in israel communities were the widows the orphans the migrants and always taken advantage of this clear violation against the law of torah and israel leaders didn't even uh, uh, didn't even bother of what uh, they were heading to even after many times of warning 
We also see in chapter 7 or in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 7, that, uh, you know, we, we see that Israel, Israelites are coming to worship their God in the temple as if everything is just and fine. But at the same time, outside the temple, they are worshipping other gods. And some of them were even adopting, uh, you know, uh, even sacrificing their children to the Canaanite gods. So all this stirs God's wrath against them. And so Jeremiah makes a very unpopular announcement that God of Israel is coming to judge them. He's going to destroy his own temple and punish Israelite for, uh, you know, uh, Israelite for uh, doing all such unevil uh, uh, evil things against God. And God will send an enemy from the north. And this is an army that God would allow to conquer Jerusalem. And with this, we also see in chapter 25 that Israel hasn't turned back to the God, even despite of uh, uh, many warnings given by Jeremiah to Israel. And Israel has not shown or not uh, given uh, any kind of interest to Jeremiah's words, and they never turned back to God. So in the first year of the Babylon's new king, King Nebuchadnezzar, God tells Jeremiah to announce that the Babylonian army are headed for Israel and all its neighbors will conquer them and take them into exile for 70 long years. And here he compares Babylon to a cup of wine filled to the brim with God's wrath at all of Israel's injustice and idolatry and God will make Israel, the nation, drink from this cup. Now, this chapter is a key to the book design because everything that follows is going to focus on Babylon's coming to attack Israel. And from chapter 26 to 45, here we see how Jeremiah begged Israel to turn back. He literally cries and mourns, saying, Israel, repent. Repent from your sinful nature. Come back to God. He literally cries, begging them. But we see Israelites ignore the man of God, ignore the cry. Their hearts are so hardened that they are not able to give ears to the words which he is proclaiming. He is a, time and again, Jeremiah is reminding the laws, the covenant of God that they have made towards the living God. He reminds them about the Torah. But then Israel, Israelites' heart was so hard that they were, uh, they never, uh, uh, you know, uh, they never uh, gave hear to Jeremiah, and their heart was so hardened that you know they completely rejected him. Well, this section also concludes with a large collection of other stories of how Jerusalem was under siege and eventually destroyed by Babylon and about how Jeremiah was persecuted all through the time. And eventually, Jeremiah was kidnapped and taken against his will to Egypt to a group of Israelite rebels. I, somebody has just logged in. Yeah. So uh, we see that how uh, Jeremiah was kidnapped and taken against his will to Egypt and by a group of Israelite rebels. And now right here in the middle, uh, in uh, in middle, we see that, you know, dark stories of disaster and judgment is a collection of Jeremiah's message of hope and Israelites, Israel's future. So he picks up on Moses' prediction that after Israel had broken the covenant and gone into exile, we see in Deuteronomy, like God would not abandon his people, rather 
he would renew his covenant with them and transform their heart and jeremiah also reminds them about the promise uh, that god is going to one day inscribe the law of torah not on the tablet but rather on each one's heart of his own people and he is going to heal their rebellion nature so that they can truly one day love god and worship him in truth and in spirit and so one day israel will return back to the land and the messiah from the line of david is going to come and that's when all nations will come to recognize that israel's god is the true god so we also see in this book that despite israel's apostasy god is not going to let israel sin but rather uh, god's uh, through god's own faithfulness he will bring them back and fulfill the promise uh, no matter uh, what they are god will never abandon israel like that but he will see the ways how he can redeem them so we find a large collection of poems about how god is going to use babylon Uh, you know to judge and about how he is going to redeem israel from the hands of uh, such a wicked kingdom and although god used this nation to execute as justice uh, that is the babylon and egypt and assyrians but god does not endorse their violence in idolatry and we see how god stands uh, to redeem his people from the hands of these uh, kingdom which they were in, taken as exile so jeremiah uh, so the book concludes with a story taken from the end of the book of second kings it tells about babylon's final attack on jerusalem and how they destroyed the city walls and burned the temple and took the people into exile well the story shows how jeremiah warns of judgment from you know from chapter 1 to chapter 24 we see how they fulfilled uh, you know uh, the uh, fulfilled all that jeremiah prophesied and he also witnessed the people been going to exile and yeah and uh, that's how the book ends so it's a little glimmer of hope He, he, though he talks about the judgment at the same time jeremiah also gives a hope and he also says there's a future for israel because god is a god of mercy and grace and here he recalls jeremiah's promise of hope from chapter 32 to 33 we see that god has an abandoned his people or the promise of future coming king from david's line here we see that he is talking about the messiah Jesus who will come to redeem his people and so while this book contains a huge amount of warning and judgment the final words conclude with a note of hope for the future as well so we also see the portrayal of the shadow of Christ in this book where it says the messiah is clearly seen in uh, in chapter 23 the first half of the verse as a coming shepherd and the righteous branch will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land so in his days uh, judah will be saved he will bring in the new covenant which will fulfill god's covenant with abraham moses and the people and david so we see that god and israel's relationship began like a marriage god owed to be faithful and israel promised to be lovingly his but israel repeatedly broke that vow and worshiped and sacrificed the false god so israel even killed their own children in their rituals as we saw in the previous chapters and uh, we we also see jeremiah called israel as an idolatrous and it worshiped other gods israel was really committing adultery against god and jeremiah begged israel to return and repent so that they can be forgiven and be sa- and and be saved but israel would not listen 
to Jeremiah because their heart were hardened towards his word. So Israel chose to break their vows with God and the covenant with God. And God promised that he will, uh, despite of Israel's nature, unfaithful nature, God, you know, God promised that he would be faithful as just like a husband. He will be a faithful husband to his adulterous bride. So we see the plan of God. He says that in Jesus, he would begin a new covenant that would transform his people from adultery and make them virgin bride once again. So there's kind of a hope in the message. Though Jeremiah is giving a, a message of judgment that is coming upon the people of Israel as a consequence of their sin. But at the same time, we see Jeremiah uh, also give a, a, a hope and a future for the Israelites that they will not be wiped out. But then God is all mindful of redeeming his children. Uh, despite of the consequence what they are in. So what we learn from this book, I open this to the class, what do we learn from the book of Jeremiah? What do we learn? Anyone in the class can say this. Well, what we learn from this book is we see that God's patience with his people in the Old Testament reminds us that God has always been and he continues to be merciful. And how we can apply it to our times, how we can apply it to ourselves personally. Though as chosen people, sometimes we ignore the covenant that has been made with God and we try to rebel against God, against his teaching. Or we go away with our own, uh, own life, with the pleasures of our own life. But God still gives us a hope. Through his mercy and grace, he tries to redeem us. He speaks to us through the Holy Spirit who's indwelling within us. He gives us many opportunity to repent and turn back to him. Though we might have fallen in our own ways, but God does not abandon us like that. But he gives us new ways where he can redeem us, restore us back to that relationship that we have. So as God was merciful to the Israelites who sinned against God, who, who broke the covenant and the vow with God, and still God had the plan of restoration through Jesus. Today, you and I, this message, we can apply it even though we may go astray. We may sin against God. We may go very far at times or in different areas in our life. But here God is saying that he is a God of restorer. When we repent our sins, when we confess our sins, he is a God ready to forgive. He is a God of mercy, God of love, God of restoration. He opens more opportunities for you and me so that we can be redeemed back. We can be restored back in the relationship through Jesus Christ who's indwelling with us. So with this, this book also leaves us with a question. Will we follow God wholeheartedly despite of what consequence we go through in our life. We need to repent and look back to God. So there are some of the highlights here in this book. I will just project it. And this is how the whole chapter has been divided. Chapter 1 to 2, we see chapter 1, we see the call of Jeremiah, the prophetic commission. And then from chapter 2, to, to chapter, uh, uh, you know, almost, yes, 46, we see the ministry of uh, Jeremiah, the prophecy towards Judah and, you know, uh, the 
some chapter 2 to chapter 30 we see before the fall how uh, the condemnation of judah the uh, uh, conflicts of jerusalem and later part we see the fall of judah future restoration as message of hope has been given to them and then later after the fall the prophecies to the gentiles and the fall of jerusalem we see that from 47 to 52 and this is some of the highlights that we discussed from this book. We can see that here. Some of the highlights I made a note so that, you know, um, even if we have missed anything in between, we can grasp these are the main important things that we should keep in our mind when we study the book of Jeremiah. That the book of Jeremiah records one of Judah's greatest prophets, prophets during its darkest days and we see many other things here. Jeremiah contains the Bible's most extended and detailed prophecies about Babylon and mentioning it 164 times in this book. And Jeremiah also records the three important Old Testament covenants, that is the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the New Covenant. And we also see the Messiah uh, seen clearly in chapter 23, verse 1 to 8, as the coming shepherd and the righteous branch who will reign as king and act wisely to justice and righteousness in the land. With this, we will also give a reflection that the book of Jeremiah reveals the inner struggles the prophets of God. They shared with God how he felt, yet he disobeyed. Jeremiah is a yet he obeyed. Jeremiah is a picture of faithfulness to God and great personal sacrifice in spite unimaginable op opposition. So, what price we can ask ourselves, what price are be willing to pay in order to be faithful to God? Do we share our feeling to God without any filters? We can ask ourselves and meditate today on the book of Jeremiah as we study. Are we faithful to God? Yeah, with this I open to the class. You all can share your views, your thoughts. What was your learning from this book of Jeremiah? Yeah, Divya, you can go ahead, speak out. Yeah, I was just reflecting on the nature of God. Um, yeah, he, he needs to be right, uh, like he's a righteous God and he's a just God, but uh, he's also merciful. Uh, so even though there is, uh, you know, uh, so much provision uh, had been given, like even Jeremiah's uh, prophecy and warnings, they did not turn to God um, and had to face the judgment. And we see that in the new covenant, how uh, God himself made the way. There's nothing that uh, we have done, but God himself made the way. So, yeah, I was just thinking of the verse in Psalms 103 where it says he's gracious and compassionate, is slow to anger and abounding in love. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Divya, for sharing. Very important. Yeah. We also see a question from Elisha, like what is the relationship between prophet's burden and his ministry? Can anyone answer that? Take up that question. Brother Lubega or Brother Subhashish, would you like to answer that? What I feel is uh, the relationship between that is we see that God has called Jeremiah from the mother's womb 
and God has placed that burden. God has called him as a prophet and God has also placed that burden for the Israel nation. God actually revealed what he feels for Israel. We see the heart of God when Jeremiah wept and burdened for Israel time and again, though he was mocked, he was persecuted. Uh, you know, uh, he had to, uh, uh, he was taken into exile and, you know, he was put in prison. Uh, many things he had to undergo, many persecution and struggle he had to go through. But despite all, God has put this burden within uh, Jeremiah's heart that he had to cry and weep for Israel. Throughout his life, we see him struggle to redeem Israel. We see the heart of God in him. Actually, I guess that it was put by God himself. That burden for Israel was put by God himself. And whenever, uh, in fact, uh, it says that Jeremiah didn't like this office, but then God used him there. And when he was uh, prophesying or when he was talking, uh, though he had difficulty in sp speech, um, he was very weak, he was not very bold enough. But when the time of uh, prophesying came, he was bold enough to speak. He spoke the word of God with courage which with boldness. So we see that uh, in the Old Testament, we see time and again, the spirit of the Lord came upon a person and it went. We see that he could prophesy with the spirit of God upon him. He could speak boldly. And at the same time, we see the heart of God on him that he wept for Israel. That's why he has been called as a weeping prophet moaned uh, bitterly for Israel's nature, uh, for their rebellious nature. And he moaned. So in that morning, we see the burden, we see the heart of God in him. And yes, that's his ministry, God has called. He was not. Hardship because he had to go through it because that was his call and he went through it. Thank you, Aisha, for the question. Anyone else would like to share anything? Okay. As the time's up, we can end this class with a word of prayer. Uh, can I request Elisha to end this, to dismiss us with a word of prayer, please? Thank you. We are praying. Yes. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for this moment of our lives. We want to thank you for the life of Jeremiah and what you use him for the ministry of the prophets that has impacted generation and it is impacting us this morning also. We pray that, O oh God, even as you showed mercy, grace to your people, may you continue to show us grace and mercy even when we depart from your, from your will and disobey you. Lord, may your love, steadfast love, continue to draw us to your righteousness and to your holiness in the name of Jesus. Father, we continue to pray that you establish us in your word so that we will not go away or depart from your word. That we pray that if we have fallen into any captivity, if we have fallen into the hands of our enemies, as the Israelites fell in the hands of Babylon, Lord, may you redeem us in the name of Jesus. Father, we continue to pray that you sustain us in your grace and your mercy throughout the day. Father, as we are stepping out, O oh God, may you continue to lavish us with your mighty love in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you, Elisha. Thank you so much for each one joining today's class. God bless. See you all tomorrow. Thank you. God bless.